Here is the, um, uh, the f one of the earliest growth in terms of volume came in terms of unstructured data. So um, in 80s, when we used to talk about data and data, then we typically would be talking about databases and we'll keep that data about sales, inventory, retail, uh, finance, all that. Those are structured databases. So we have this network model, hierarchical model, that relational model. Right? So we had that. And then uh, enterprises and basically uh, networks, uh, even the web, they started to have much larger growth of unstructured data. Unstructured data meaning they are not in a table form, they are not in object related form, any of those things, right? But something else has changed in last 10 years. What has changed there? Uh, there, are, there are new forms of um, uh, data that have come in, right? What are they? User generated data has been there, but that is part of unstructured data. It's still textual data. Even before machine generated data, there was some huge change that happened. <coughs> Digital photography followed by video. Today, if you are using Time Warner or Comcast or whatever, um, they are the pipes for internet at home, right? What What is the biggest uh, type of data that is consumed? Video. 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 Right. Broadcast video. <coughs> TV or most of it, right? Your cable. Mm -hmm. And uh, then people who are giving up the cable and uh, also but that's um, you know when you when you're looking at YouTube, when you're looking at Netflix, when you're looking at in future HBO HBO is joining that also, right? Okay. So there is while that data is grown, and lately it has been really, majority of the data now is video data. Um, and that's why, for example, um, uh, uh, the uh, um, charter got an agreement for payment from Netflix. And there was this, this big uh, about net neutrality. So that was in this slide, where um, there's a lot of video data, um, uh, other data gets, might get you know, compromised and Netflix has to have good quality of service. <coughs> so it has to, you know, so the cable company said, well, if you want good you know, quality of service, pay us. But then if you start paying for the data, that means uh, that can have, they, they can ask now for anybody else who don't pay, saying pay us, otherwise you will not get good quality of service, right? And that's an issue tied to net neutrality. Anyway, the point for here is that the type of, uh, there's a huge volume of data. But that is because of a lot of different variety of the data. Uh, one point, uh, what is one most important point that is made here? When I uh, gave this presentation, what was the point, or the most important point made? Vishnu, on this slide. Regarding the clear? Mm -hmm. And the video, video I made one point when I gave a talk, when I gave the talk that you saw. Small percentage of the data is usable. No, not usable, something else. Not usable, something else. It says actually on the slide itself. So how would that analyze? Very small percent of data is analyzed. So data is there, but if you're not analyzing, that means it's actually not much used. Our capacity to generate data exceeded our capacity to store the data in which year? 2008. Okay. And the other thing is that the data is not just. So, from a typical stack, uh, when you talk about typically textual data, you're talking about the structured, semi structured, unstructured data, right? But there's also this other modality, audio, Pandora, and whatever. Uh, images, uh, you know, digital photography, and video. Plus, increasingly, other sensor data. Right? And the data
data changes, there's a lot of real-time data, and what they carry, what they talk about changes very frequently, and that comes with, that's called velocity. Right? Okay. And um, increasingly, that data is coming from people acting as sensor. I'd use the word citizen sensing. So two billion sensors and, uh, you know, two billion citizen sensors, so roughly uh, over two billion people now have data plans or internet, some, some sort of internet connectivity or some sort of, so more than voice, use of more than voice. So that means there is text or some other thing used. That means they are generating data. That, that data can get onto the web. Right? And um, the estimate is anywhere between 26 million and, seven, sorry, 26 billion and 20, and 75 billion, depending upon Gartner or IDC or whosoever you believe, in 2020. Okay. So we will have 10 times more or 20 times <coughs> more of those sensors up there relaying the data also. Okay. And, and the difference will be humans they may treat or use mobile phone and the amount of data they generate other than the video will be very small. These guys are constantly capturing, every minute they are taking a thing, every uh, continuously they are looking at traffic, they are used for road traffic. Or they are on the, looking at the platform of the railway station, continuously looking at that data. So, massive growth in the data. And uh, fixed computing, you go to the device, you used to use the computer, mobility computing, bring your own device, device goes with you, internet of things and internet of everything. And the number of users and number of people creating the data. So, so this is the digital data growth, and the point is everything has become data driven, and there are all these different kinds of data: physical, cyber, social data. Physical data is all this Internet of Things data. Cyber data is all the things you know about the web, the data on the web. Some of them are these coming up on the web. Social data, some of them coming up on the web. But the, these are typically uh, data like open government data, you know, like weather data, and so on and so forth. And it, they work in a very synergistic way. For example, on the web, we earlier had, had seen the demo of uh, calling up a sensor and saying, what is the ring now? You're getting the physical data but on the cyber. But beyond that, there are data like scientific literature all the publications, let's say. So that's not physical, that's not social. And that is blue-blooded um, web data, right? Now this is like that you're not changed, uh, not seen. What is not changed, basically, is that um, your problem, and you want to use computing to solve to solve the problem. In the human world, your problem, you observe it, you come up with a solution. In the when you want to use computer, that problem is representative. In terms of data structures that computer programs operate on, right? <coughs> that is not a full reality. <coughs> You're not capturing. The, all the nuances, all the data, you are going to make selection. Oh, maybe this data is more important than that. Maybe I'll take this sample of the data. Maybe I'll take this coverage. <coughs> all that kind of stuff are done. And suppose you uh, want to, let's say, um, uh, come up with an environmental model or weather prediction model. The theory would say take, you know, some cube and in that every point there is a pressure and blah, blah, blah. You know, you, know you, you figure out 
that, that takes massive amount of computing power, massive amount of uh, data storage and all that. I don't have it. So I'll say, I'll sample it. That's just an example of simplification you do. Right? And then you write your program, which is supposed to mimic what is the real world. Not the real world. It's supposed to mimic. Suppose you're doing behavioral economics. Again, it's supposed to mimic the human decision making. But it's not the human decision making. So, almost everything we do in computational paradigm is sim simplification. We create models, we create approximations. Here, though, things change in the following way and material way. What has changed is that come earlier, we only had certain in level of information available about the real world. Imagine about the event of a traffic accident 20 years ago. What information would you be aware? Would you have that? Uh, what, would, what information would you have available about that traffic accident 20 years ago? And today, so even 20 years ago, people we are used to more. They used to model traffic patterns, but their job, in some sense, was simpler because just so much data was available. Now today, what will you have it? What will you have? CCTV. You have CCTV. What else? You got road sensors. You have road sensors, coils in the road. What else? Traffic meeting. And you have on the web, uh, you know, if there is a planned event, uh, you know, the local agency would have put saying uh, that this road uh, will be rebuilt from this time to this time or be closed. It's there on the web. Right? So the potential types of data that you have is a lot more. Hence, the challenge that we face in creating a computer solution is much higher, albeit. We have a lot more. We are going closer to the real world, though. With all these different type of information, we have a lot more information uh, to capture about the real world out there. As a human would observe it, and and uh, you would convey through tweets, or as a you know uh, uh, variety of uh, sensor data that you capture, right? So we need computational paradigms to tap into rich parts of the human population utilize much more diverse data compared to before. We need to represent, capture, and compute rich, with richer and fine-grained representation of the real world problem. The data and the speed at which we are gathering the data fa much faster. That's the velocity. Our model data we capture much faster, much more. Um, the type of data we capture, variety, a lot more. With that in mind, we come up with, we come up with this um, uh, paradigm, uh, which uh, consists of physical cyber social computing. I already just gave you example of physical cyber social kind of data, right? That means we have richer kind of data. You have more, you know, we get more variety, more velocity. More, we just discuss those now. How, what, what needs to be changed? What, what, what computational paradigm we can come up with so that we can keep up with, handle this kind of more complexity? So we came up with this um, pyramid. So let's see, who wants to explain this? Kalpa, explain this. Uh, I don't see the exact uh, text, but I can explain. You have so, you heard the video, so you yeah. can explain. Uh, so we get uh, data, so it's the basic level. So we can try to get meaning out of this data. So you can annotate and then try to get additional information on top of this not so meaningful data. So, the, so you can use external information. So the next step, you convert this data into information. 
and then the next step you have the information so you can further get intuition or the human understanding on this so you can be on the top level towards the wisdom so uh, you can further uh, I think you missed out first of all if you're going the DIK the blue tri uh, triangle which is data information knowledge wisdom then you mm. missed out on the knowledge oh, yeah. but that is not the issue here what I'm talking about uh, what, what, what was the core thing you came up with in terms of PCS computing Horizontal operators and vertical operators. And vertical operators. Okay, yeah. so Shiva, explain. What is the horizontal operator? Horizontal operators include the sources where we get the data from, like human sensors or the, I mean, machines and uh, human citizen sensors like beeping and all. All are, all are part of the horizontal, horizontal operators here. So essence, some essence of that is not missing yet. That's not exactly what. Kind of in the general area that there are all these kind of data, but something else is missing. Others? So what does horizontal operator do? Integrate semantics. Semantically integrate them, right? Yeah. The point here is that um, you have the traffic accident. That is the event. Mm -hmm. You have video data of that. You have uh, some sensor data of that. You have feet. You have something <coughs> else. And even just the recognition that all these data relate to that singular event. They relate to. Relate means semantic. The, in, in the one of the top uh, to be able to say they relate means you are doing semantic integration of the data. How would you integrate uh, uh, Twitter data with a video data, at, in a in a in a computational sense? Structurally, in a way you put, you put in a file or you know data format, they are very different. There has to be some way to have some sort of mythical, uh, some sort of uh, virtual pointer. Uh, uh, that pointer says that these both relate to the same uh, event. Not some different days, not some different time, the same, right? So, for example, here the context, you, you relate them in a context, one co uh, part of context could be time, same time, location, spatial. So you have spatial temporal context, with which you can say the data is the same. And not necessarily that that may not itself be enough. You may have spatial, temporal, thematic context that they both relate to accident. I may have data at the same time and location, and yet it uh, is uh, focusing on something else that is not related to. Uh, you know, for, uh, am I interested in the car get, get, that is crushed or a person that is uh, uh, you know uh, 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 that is hurt? There are different thematic elements. So are they about the same or different, right? But typically events would have time, space, and topic component. And that can become what you might call as a context. In that context, the data get related. The semantics here is spatial, temporal, thematic. That is, those are the dimensions of semantics. So the horizontal operator is simply Telling you that all this data is all this form, but they relate to the same thing. Right? Why is this so important? What is different compared to what we do by and large today? So you can complement your one source of data with others, enrich. That's right. But uh, oh, set up. Tell me what, what, how is it very different from what do we do today. Today, by and large, you build powerful video processing system, you build power image processing system, you build powerful text processing system. They're very isolated from each other. Yeah, Super they mode. typically are unimodal. Mm -hmm. But the world, as I said in the previous slide, is very rich. Right? So to be able to operate 
on this richness is why I define horizontal operator. It is a, simply an expression that I need a computational system in which I am able to handle the richness of the data necessary for me to understand and solve that problem. Problem in this case of understanding uh, the traffic issue or accident. That is different. Think about it. And people build sophisticated remote system, but the fact that the world has become very rich, it, uh, many events, many applications require physical cyber social data. Within even, let's say, physical data form, there will be different sensors, so there will be different modalities. And, and the core to the vision, computational vision, is that I need to build a system that deals with all these there are, you know, types of complementary data on the same situation to, you know, that give different aspects of the richness of the situation. The data, the information that is conveyed, the word is chosen information very, uh, you know, uh, intentionally. The information conveyed by a Twitter data about a traffic is different than the information conveyed by a video data about, uh, for the same accident. Both of them are conveying information. Both of them are very different type of uh, data, but on the same event. That is the horizontal operator. Why could, what is the vertical operator? The vertical operator is like the, it extracts the necessary uh, data which is required for the uh, decision making and the intelligence to be uh, acquired from the data which is got. So it gets meaning out of the data. Yes, but we'll, I want to say it a little differently. Yeah, yeah. Extracting yeah, the data yeah. semantically uh, from the uh, from one level and moving it to the next level. Okay. So, so you basically what I'm trying to yeah. say is the following, that um, if you were in the early in the class also I had given an example, I get number 35, the point is 35 degrees. And then it is not human, we are not acting that much on the 35 degrees. We are active, acting that on the fact that we interpret 35 as warm or cold. It's 35 degrees. For me, 35 degrees Fahrenheit is pretty cold. For this gentleman, I know it's not that cold. He likes cold weather. And I love, I mean, I'm happy with 80s. He thinks anything above 75 is hot, right? So what he and I talk uh, are, are acting upon is abstraction. We are not acting upon data. We both have the same data, 35 degrees or 85 degrees. But the thing we act upon, the thing we decide upon is different. That's abstraction. So we need a computational paradigm that takes data is plentiful, massive, var various, right? All that data is there. And this, that, as we just discussed, that is growing very rapidly, has grown. Brain capacity is not growing anymore. We have, you know, our brain cycles are, are have not shown to be much faster. Maybe they are 1% faster than uh, people decade ago. If there is, you know, because we kind of our like, you know, our, our life is more hectic, so maybe we are processing, we are more maybe we getting used to doing. But it's not gone up two times. It's not gone up three times. The data has gone up thousand times and million times. Every two years, more data is generated than all the previous history in the mankind. Of the mankind, right? So. Um, All the data that is growing so fast has to be con brought in into the level of abstraction at which you, you know on which humans decide and human cycles don't grow very fast. What there are two very fundamental things we end up doing there. I'll come to that very soon. <coughs> so I have a bunch of applications that I discuss that. And um, um,
I'll come to this bit later on, but let me describe two of the fundamental points. So the three, three very important words, which I'll again come to later on, but I'm saying that out of order here. Personalization or personalize, contextualize and actionable. <coughs> so what I'm interested in is through these vertical and horizontal operators, I am interested in ultimately making decisions and taking actions from all the massive amount of data. There are uh, there are few things that uh, 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 that I can use as tools or 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 parts of my process methods. One is that. In the process of converting data into something of high level, interpret better, get meaning, but interpret better, we use knowledge. Second is, using the knowledge, I can say this is the data and this is the information. I can create massive amount, but because the data is massive, amount of information is also massive. Information is just, can be metadata, just some interpreted data. Right? But because data is so much, it's be massive. Again, as I said, human cycles are, you know, we don't have a lot more cycles than we used to have before. So having too much information itself, whether you call it data overload or information overload, the word information overload is probably well known. That's, so you, know, you have to address that problem. So then what happens? You apply, just like any other you know, computational problem, you apply filters. And there are two different kinds of filters that I can think of, maybe more but two that I can think of right now. One is personalize. Would it be of interest to me? Based on <coughs> whatever the system knows about me, you know, I like to buy, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I like to, you know, perhaps it is possible that Tanvi or Farah may be more likely to buy uh, female clothing and I may be more likely to buy male clothing. Right? So there's a personalization aspect, right? There's information, all that beautiful clothes out there. If you personalize for me, you probably want to show me clothing for men, and you want to personalize for them, you want to show clothing for uh, women. So clearly you are, you know, uh, cutting down from all the information out there, all the clothing information out there, you're going to cut down, right? So that's one. Or there is contextualize. The same person looking at information, I suppose I have a festival coming, Christmas coming. The kind of, uh, and suppose I'm, I'm, I'm talking about buying toys, and I'm personalized. But the kind of toys I may be interested in at Christmas time is different than the time of, uh, you know, type of toys I may be interested in in the birthday of my child. That's contextualized. So again, this is another way of filtering it, right? So from all that large amount of information coming from massive amount of data, we will personalize, we will contextualize, among other things, to make the data more actionable. And I'll see more examples later on, okay? So, so I have a few uh, examples. Um, all right, so this is something now, Tim, you want to explain what I discussed here in this part of the video? Uh, well, this is where you start talking about, uh, well, well, the life measure, this is talking about basically all the sensors on the people and trying to integrate healthcare and healthcare data, you know, having so many problems with people, uh, re-getting sick and things <coughs> like that, and so then... That is too general. I was trying to say something very specific here. Yeah, uh, what is the name of this guy? Quantified. Quantified self is uh, this example of quantified self, meaning, and I mentioned that word. But what is what is the name of this guy? You should recall. PhD students should recall. We have talked about it many times, and I have asked you to watch his video, the whole one hour long video. Did you watch that? What is his name? He's Larry Smart. Yeah. And um, what is the disease we are talking about? Crohn's disease. 
Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, not Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease. Or another form of irritable bowel syndrome. It's some, you know, a combination of Crohn's disease and irritable bowel uh, related disease. <coughs> and the, what, what is the point being made here? It's one of the computer, uh, I mean, he's one of the faculty member who works on more on the sensors and uh, he started, uh, I mean, he started working on the sensors and he kept uh, everything on his and he find that he has a disease of uh, chronic. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. He, he, has a, he has a lab and a very, yeah. you know, it's not focused just on this thing. Okay. The, the, there's a lot of other things. They do a lot of visualization and other things. He found out himself before doctors. So he went to doctors and said, I have this. And then yeah. So the, the point here is that he was able to collect all different kinds of data about his own body and even diagnose a disease that he had. This is the fundamental thing. So, so guys, can you re watch your video, you know, and all that? It's very important that, you know, you, you focus on the right thing. There are all this stuff, right? But what is the most important thing here? The important thing is that a, hu you know, a totally mm. new capability that was not there. <coughs> you could not have conceived having this kind of capabilities 10, 20, 30 years ago. He has access to all kinds of body signals, data. He has access electronically to all kinds of medical literature. And he was able to essentially do the function of a doctor. And in fact, there's, there's a uh, long, more than a long uh, year, uh, our, our long video that he has, wonderful talk he gave, where he talks about this whole process and how in fact, the fact that he had gone to a specialist who had failed in finding the things. But there's another point that I would like to make and that we, you know, we should recognize. What, what we have like time to do, you know, we have a project called K-Health, is that we want to give that power, that capability that Larry Smart had to common person. <coughs> that is the power thing, what we are trying to do. That's the vision. That's what, we, you know, if you can get that, that's why I want to make us, you know, our opinion. And how are you trying to do it? What, what will you have to do for that? Well, first, simpler thing. Simpler thing would be to deal with the different sensors. You have one disease, you have different kinds of things to measure, other disease, different measure. So we need sensors, fine. You need some computational platform. You can have cloud or you can have mobile phone, doesn't matter. You have that. There are pros and cons for that too. But then, the harder part is neither of these things. Harder part is the knowledge about the disease. That's why you need doctor. Not because you will measure this or not. That will be done by nurse. That will be done by your. Increasingly, it will be done by you. My doctor has uh, my chart. He wants me to fill out all the information before I go and see him. Earlier, you know, he would you know ask me questions and fill out. Now he has only has fifteen minutes slot. So you know, he he wants. Eventually, he would ask me to upload my own sensor data. Why does he? Why does he has to pay for the nurse to do that? If there are FDA approved, uh, you know, um, uh, this thing, uh, devices that can do take your EKG, why do you need nurse? In principle, these these things will change. Right? The harder thing is though <coughs> that medical knowledge, the relevant medical knowledge, this vast amount of medical knowledge of which you have to get the relevant knowledge, that particular protocol related to disease, and come to a conclusion. Right? Now, here's the thing to notice. Check out the Ebola protocol, detection protocol. It is very likely. Look, people, a common person is getting trained to identifies whether some person has Ebola or not. Or at least to identify the potential of a person to have Ebola or not. That can be automated hmm. completely. There's no need for human for that kind of stuff. These are very simple protocols, relatively speaking. You need to do them well. You don't want human mistakes. 
But you, you know, these are all audible. So if all of all these things, the point here is though, that Larry is not after what this sensor gives me or what that sensor gives me. Larry is after I am having I, I'm I am having this pain in my body or whatever. Or I have this thing with my stool or whatever. What is it? Right? Again, actionable. <laughs> because what he wants to do is to manage remove the disease or manage it, whatever is possible. Now, the thing, the harder part, again, what the researchers among you should have noticed is that the harder part mm -hmm. is to um, not, it's not about getting all the data and massive amount of data and all the stuff. Harder part is about the computations that uh, um, supports an upper level, if I want to call upper level is uh, one which is close to uh, something that helps humans make decisions or act on something. Right? We, we use the word abstractions for that. There is a word that is well, you know, okay, we'll come to the word use for solution, right? So, in the case of asthma, that is a disease. You will have a lot of time, you can get a lot of data that is potentially relevant to it. You also call personal signals. So this one has 12 built in sensor, it gives you indoor humidity, it gives you um, uh, a temperature, uh, indoor temperature, it gives you um, uh, several other things. This is a nitric oxide, which tells you, uh, you know, how well your um, lungs are functioning. You will have a colon. Many people have uh, allergic colon and that triggers asthma. Or carbon dioxide or other things in the air or smog, basically. You'll have, you know, what, you know, the population signal, public signal saying, oh, there is an epidemic going on here. That kind of data. All these can be relevant. So, the issue here, which is at the human decision making level, are uh, how is my asthma, uh, uh, how is my asthma control, how well controlled is my asthma? Should I take additional medication today? How can I reduce my asthma attacks at home? Or at night, or whatever those questions are. That's what people are interested in. So, um, To do that then, those, these are the words here, right? You need to contextualize all the data, personalize it, um, and make it actionable. Contextualize all the possible traffic information out there that is that could be relevant to your thing. Personalize your specific route that is interesting. And then make a decision what you're going to do. Uh, I had used this word smart data that I'm going to come to, but I, you know, this is from a 2004 slide where I talked about uh, smart data, uh, use of ontologies and data repository to gain relevant insights. Something relevant, insights. Insight again is at a, a human decision making level. So, to me then, smart data is something that makes sense out of big data, sense to human, sense to uh, human sensibility sends to uh, sense as in ability for human to make decisions or helping human to make decisions and act upon those things, right? So it provides value. There are sometimes people talk about five V's. The fifth V is the value. Four, first four V's are the problems or challenges. Last V is what you want. So it provides value from harnessing the challenges posed by these other Vs of big data, in turn providing actionable information and improved decision making. So the point here is that um, in most of the computing work that we do, we learn, we learn how to deal with and benefit from or you know a lot of volume. 
we learn how to find a pattern from a velocity. We learn how to integrate the data. We learn fi to find out whether data is believable, trustworthy, and all that. A lot of that. What has been missing in my view, or where there has been less information, uh, emphasis than is necessary, is this thing. That any one of these are okay. These are, you know, when people don't pay for um, uh, gadgets uh, just to hold the gadgets. People pay for the gadgets to use it for something like entertainment or games or whatever they want to use it for. Right? So, and there is another kind of take that it's about extracting value by improving human involvement in everything that happens with the data, creating, processing, consuming data, such that you can improve human experience. Human experience is a very broad term in that uh, it basically means that you can take better decisions, make you healthier, make you happier. These are all human qualities that make up our experience. Right? So I'm not talking about you know whether you are you know whether it's hot or cold even. I'm talking about whether you're happy or not. It's a very you know, and the point is though, the real value is in you know improving human experience, such as health, such as uh, you know happiness. So today we we deal with a lot of data that is about human activity. You know, these are all the sensors on the person and it shows how the person is moving. This is, um, you know, uh, uh, blood pressure uh, machine. Here it tells me, uh, oh, you were, uh, you know, somebody has a status message, I'm at Las Vegas airport. So I know what you are doing. And I get a lot of information from what you are either doing or what you are thinking. And this is all related to human activities that are being created. And they are physical data, they are social data, they are data on the web. There's also a lot of data by the human. Some of us go on Wikipedia and change something and add our own information there. Some uh, um, uh, of us are, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, tweeting and saying, I saw that accident. Some of our, um, uh, you know, um, maintaining some database about chemical compounds and they all show up here. Some of us go and tag in a photograph. This is a photograph of pizza, <coughs> uh, in the tower of pizza, right? So we are creating the data through our explicit involvement and in, by us, by our activity. And then this data, for human, which is improving human health uh, experience, in this case, health or smart health. So you have a Asthma application, which has a lot of different things like wheezing sound measurement, indoor temperature measurement, humidity, dust, pollen, carbon monoxide and dioxide, all these things are the data. And the idea here is that in the physical world would be to find that there is high CO2 content at home during the day. And also the knowledge that uh, high CO2 leads to asthma attack. So action will be to close the doors or windows. <coughs> that is what we are trying to achieve. And this is what smart data would give you. By the way, smart data is partly misnomer in the sense smart data is not data. It is data on which smart decisions are made. And the data is used very vaguely here. It is, in fact, more of an abstraction, not the uh, data as we're talking about in data information knowledge. This is even easier and more uh, convincing example. I, I have the ability to, you know, uh, today we have systems that have ability to measure electricity usage over the day, every time, every moment. Uh, devices that are working, which devices are working, what is the power consumption of those devices, cost per kilowatt hour, heat index, relative humidity, and many things of that nature, right? Public event from the social stream that will tell you whether there will be high usage, right? Uh, there is a uh, usage-based pricing. 
that kind of stuff. All that is there, and then what is the future nest device? We'll do this. It says washing and drying has resulted in significant cost since it was done using during peak period, peak load period. Consider changing this time to night. Right? So you could change, you know, you could save money and help environment. But this is easily said than done. It is not even as easy as what I'm saying here. Why? Because what if the it will save uh, cost uh, two percent? Human may not change his behavior. It's significant here. It's significant enough for that person. So it not only is con contextualized in terms of the washing, drying, and the time, it is personalized. That it's so you know that there is some smartness in the system that says, hmm, this guy is not going to is is not going to care about two percent saving, five percent saving, but more than ten percent saving, he might be tempted to make change the tile and you know, change the time. So being a is pervasive, it's everywhere, but it's a smart data that matters. But what we want to do is to, with all the data, physical, cyber, social data, an increasing amount of knowledge available in a variety of ways, which I won't discuss too much today, we have discussed that in other classes. With personalization and contextualization, I want to improve our ability to, uh, to our decision making and make better you know and, and, and timely actions and better actions for better outcome for humans. So now this is a little bit new. Um, what kind of computational paradigms are necessary to achieve what we are talking about? And I'm going to, for that, I'm taking analogy from uh, research and literature in cognitive science and cognitive <coughs> modeling. So there is this uh, models that talk about top and bottom brain. That doesn't mean it is actually tied with exact, you know, real human brain thing. Okay. Yes, actually, it so happens that there are different kind of activities in different part of the brain. And there is a physical region of human brain and all that. But much of the thing that is attributable to human brain or a top brain or bottom brain uh, could be through observations, as cognitive science may do. It may not be through poking the uh, you know, sensor within the brain and uh, actually seeing your environment. We still are far, far away to go. In fact, some of you who are on my G plus student uh, stream might have seen um, the post I made, right, uh, of uh, by whom. Did you look at that post? There's a lot of posts. <laughs> Yesterday, but no, the post is about brain issue, deep learning uh, related thing. And he made wonderful point about um, the, you know, that people are overselling uh, both the deep learning and they're overselling uh, you know, uh, brain, you know, our understanding of brain, how it works, and say, okay, we can do that in computing. Don't keep up. No, I, you may not have gotten, but you got it. You got it. What? What? <laughs> I've seen that. Okay. So what did he say? I've read your uh, description about it, but I didn't go to the link. Do you, you think you get time to go back to it? I go back to it. Sometime. Yeah. Really? Okay. I'll, I'll I'll test you on that. Okay. So this is by Michael Jordan. You know Michael Jordan? Not the, not the <laughs> basketball guy. I think Berkeley. He's very, very well known guy, machine learning. And um, um, you know, so so he talks about you know basically um, uh, you know overselling of some of these things, like deep learning, also. Uh, 
the fact that we really have not uh, understood the brain as much. So I'm, I'm saying that to just uh, caveat, this is more of a, you know, inf observations based and such. It's not necessarily based on understanding of tooth biology and, you know, that kind of stuff. But the, so the, the, the top, brain, top part of the brain is involved in setting up plans, controlling movements, registering changes in where objects are located in space and revising plans when anticipated events do not occur. But the point here is essentially very vague, very broadly speaking, top bra brain or, or what we will call top brain or um, is involved in, a sub, you know, there is a processes that uh, are about planning. What is good for me? What is better for me? What is my preference? Right? Those kind of stuff. What is my goal and how do I achieve my goal? Basically, that is what is about planning to achieve your goal. That's something that people talk about in AI also. Bottom is involved in classifying and interpreting what we perceive and allow us to confer <laughs> meaning to the world. That means it is about observing. This is so so if you think about machine learning as a technique. It's primarily bottom. Uh, it's kind of trying to do what so-called bottom brain does. And some of us, me included, have been saying that neither of them is sufficient. So there are people who wrote an article, and you know, uh, you know, some people I know them. Uh, they have article unreasonable effectiveness of big data or something like that. But they essentially all promise that uh, this part, saying, give me all the data and I'll tell you all kinds of stuff that you need to know about the world that you know this data represents. And then a lot of people, uh, that other, others have uh, had a problem with that theory, saying that is a good component, but that is far from sufficient component. Right? So you need both. So the, cognitive, the theory of cognitive modes emphasizes the constant close interaction of the top and bottom systems. They don't work in isolation. This is important. So I'm taking the into I'm taking the cue. I'm taking the inspiration from this aspect of cognitive modeling into our work on uh, uh, you know our research in computer science. And they, so they have come up with. Um, uh, you know, models or theory of cognitive more modes. So this Moore, uh, Moore is the more effective person, person who, you know, where he uses both top and bottom brain, very effective. Perceiver is the one who uses more of a bottom of brain, who observes around and sees and tries to get a sense of what it means, but doesn't do as much to act upon it or to plan for some specific outcome. So they are more passive in the way sort of. Similar to things, all the stuff, but never grounds himself. And the adapter, it just goes by, he does neither. They're just happy-go-lucky guy, you know, just fine, right? So, what we want to do is to take the inspiration from that and create a computational model. In fact, I need to change. I, you know, how can you take the inspiration from that for our model? Not necessarily mechanism. Mechan I can't claim exactly that I'm doing brain functions. So then, leads to this machine proposed uh, integration and interpretation of data. And uh, um, have we done this in the class before? Yeah. yeah. So you guys know we have done things in the semantic perception, right? In Telugu, we are done in the class, so you guys know that part of it. So that basically uh, talks about this abstraction. You know, here's the key thing: that nobody, our brains are not powerful enough to keep up with a lot of data. We need fewer things to work with, and those are those abstractions, which are created after you have applied personalization and contextualization. So that kind of thing comes up in the. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
example of this kehel, and uh, have we discussed this in the class? monitor uh, the weight scale and the blood pressure monitor and will, it will say what is good for the uh, I mean for the particular point of time and what he has to do no that's what it is I mean it, it can it can say what it has to do what is the main thing though? the main thing is to uh, measure or come up with or predict predict the risk the person has very important anytime you do any work always ask why first why, what, and how, in that order. Your description is largely how. But if you say why, why, what is the point? What, what is it trying to do? What is the why here? Daniel, please, what is the why? Is it the general idea to prevent hospital readmissions? Absolutely. Perfectly, perfect. Right on the spot. Right? The point is that 25% of the uh, patients get readmitted in uh, a month. 49% get readmitted uh, in, in six months. Each of the readmission could cost $50,000, six days in the hospital, right? So it's a very expensive thing. And if you can prevent, reduce that, that would be very valuable. So what is the, uh, you know, what, what is the approach to reducing that? Uh, it's, it, it, it's, the studies have found that many of these are preventable. They really, by taking timely action, precautions and otherwise, uh, timely co the action may be communicating with the uh, clinician, you can prevent uh, the very negative episode of having to go back to the hospital. So one good example, and I don't think I had this in my talk, is the following that people with uh, heart uh, uh, problems, and particularly those, these are the people, patients that have had heart surgery or, you know, they, they are acute decomposited heart failure, ADHF is the, you know, diagnosis. And so they typically have been operated upon, and then um, with the people with the heart problems of any kind, and particularly of this severe kind, they almost always have a, a problem with the renal functioning. And one key thing about renal functioning is what? Getting the excess water out of the body. Right? When renal um, uh, failure or you know, function is, is impaired, then what happens? Body retains water. This is swelling. You have swelling in leg and this and that, right? When that happens, what happens? It puts pressure on vital organ, again heart. And <coughs> there you go, right? You have your heart patient. The side effect of that is renal functioning thing that affects, you know, this retaining of body. So doctors give less medication, diuretics, things that pump out the water, helps kidney uh, throw out the water. <coughs> so it's a matter of, uh, Often, not always, but often a matter of what well, patient uh, forgot to take uh, medication. Or medication is not enough, needs, needs to increase the dose. And in many of these major you know, diseases, particularly cardiovascular thing, which is very uh, you know, manageable these days now. There's a lot of you know, progress in uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, functioning and surgery and, and medicine. Much better than, let's say, cancer. Uh, so uh, it matter is it's a matter of managing and you know giving enough time for body to, for the heart to you know heal after the surgery and you know the body to heal after the surgery and things affect so then there'll be less problem. So the problem is usually acute in the short.
short term after patients say one week after the patient sent and so on and so forth. And there, so the issue is that of many, uh, completing the risk. So timely identification that the patient is retaining body fluid. Timely, uh, you know, and that's why this will tell you that. Timely seeing that his heart rate is going high, this is actually too late. Timely seeing that his uh, you know, blood pressure is affected. Uh, you know, and these things have effect, for example, dehydration has effect, and uh, other things have effect. So, these are all like canary in the coal mine, and you find them early enough, take action early enough, and you don't have to go back to the hospital. That's what this is about. So, uh, you know, uh, we have a project with um, um, uh, Ohio State University, uh, and, and we have uh, so far uh, done. Uh, Testing is seven patients. We need to develop more. Of it. All right. So I'm going to stop here now. But um, I want to make sure you guys go through the presentation, and uh, you might. Uh, I think you got a lot of key, higher level points and important points. Uh, you know, and research centric point uh, already. So how?